Just to clear up some confusion, I am not Bernie Eccleston's mad brother. <laughs> and I had the same haircut when Boris Johnson was in nappies. I have two problems. Firstly, following Giles Brandreth is rather like chasing an ocean yacht in a pedalo. <laughs> Secondly, I have received the honour of speaking to the Wild Society on several occasions, and I'm running a bit short of stories. <clears throat> my apologies if you've heard my stuff before. I feel rather like the schoolboy who wrote to his grandparents about the performance of his school play. Our production of King Lear went very well. Most of the parents had seen the play before, but they still laughed all the same. <laughs> I mean. When I looked around for connections between Wilde and the Liberal Party, I surprised it. it was surprising just how many links there are. On the 8th of August, 1889, 132 years ago, Oscar had lunch with his friend Arthur Clifton right here in this room. Also, Oscar's, uh, Oscar's wife, Constance, was a member of the Chelsea Women's Liberal Association. Looking around at the many politicians uh, and portraits in the club here, there are three Prime Ministers, William Gladstone, Lord Rosebery, and Herbert Asquith, all of whom had connections with Oscar. He knew many other politicians of the period. His comment on them was not entirely complimentary. There is hardly a single person in the House of Commons worth painting, though many of them might be better off for a little whitewashing. <laughs> Herbert Asquith's son, Anthony, directed the first cinema adaptation of The Importance of Being Earnest, the one starring uh, Edith Evans and her handbag. The man who put up half the bail Wild in 1895, the Reverend Stuart Headlam was a regular member of the NLC and used to have lunch here with H.G. Wells. The man who destroyed Wilde in court, the barrister and politician Sir Edward Carson, was an unlikely member of the NLC. Carson is often seen in an unsympathetic light because of the court case, but it has to be added that he refused to accept the role of prosecutor in the two later trials of Wilde, and he suggested that the case should be dropped, as Oscar had suffered enough already. Also, F.E. Smith, who notoriously mistook the NLC for a public lavatory, was a long-standing legal opponent of Wilde's friend Lord Alfred Douglas in several court cases relating to Wilde's writings. Wilde also had social connections with another liberal, the Marquis of Hartington, um, now, Hartington, I, I, I noticed several portraits of the Marquis around the club. He was a prominent member in several liberal governments, despite his intellectual equipment being regarded as somewhat perfunctory. <laughs> Hartington himself admitted that um, the proudest moment in my life was when my pig won the prize at Skipton Fair. <laughs> he was keen on shooting but was notorious for being an appallingly bad shot. One day he managed, with a single bullet, to hit a pheasant, the retriever chasing it, the retriever's owner, and the chef who'd arrived carrying a tray of sandwiches. <laughs> Hartington claimed that on one occasion, I suffered an awful nightmare in which I dreamt I'd been making a speech to the House of Lords. And when I woke up, I found that I was. <laughs> Possibly the most famous of all liberal ministers was Winston Churchill. In the 1950s, Churchill was asked which figure from the past he would most like to have as a dinner guest. He replied without hesitation, Oscar Wilde. Wilde did not involve himself directly with politics though. As he said, most people who try to lead can only do so by following the mob. The Lord's temporal say nothing, the Lord's spiritual have nothing to say, and the House of Commons has nothing to say, and says it. <laughs> I first came across Oscar when I was at school, and I found a biography written by Hesketh Pearson, 
It turned out to be a firework. Hesketh Pearson belonged to an older school of biography, that of devil-may-care, elbow-nudging partisanship. Reading his wild was like glimpsing an impressionist painting as opposed to examining an autopsy. But the real revelation was Oscar Wilde himself. I have been used to regarding literary figures as prepackaged exam fodder, but his personality gleamed like a headlamp in a fog. Here was a rebel whose weapon was laughter, an intellectual to whom pedantry was anathema, a man of conspicuous kindness who was capable of annihilating his opponents in a sentence. A sage who declared that most people die of a sort of creeping common sense. An amiably boozy, overweight, tragic hero who flew too near the sun, crashed to his ruin, and then on his deathbed joked about the wallpaper. He was the ultimate lion in a den of Daniels. He was an, an intoxicating delivery. In those days, of course, I did not know just how intoxicating he was to be in my life. I didn't start out in theatre playing Oscar Wilde, although it seems like it. My first job was as acting stage manager at the Oxford Playhouse. Due to most of the cast going down with flu, I was promoted to playing four dead pirates in their production of Treasure Island. My stage debut lines, therefore, were restricted to three death screams, one muted, ah, and one spoken line, ah, sure enough, Long John. <laughs> I remember one performance when halfway through the show, the actor playing Dr. Livesey walked off stage into the wings. He approached me and said, I, I dropped my contact lens out there. We stared out across the boards to where a vigorous fight was in progress around the pirate stockade. I spotted a glint of light about 15 feet away. It was the missing lens. Dr. Livesey stared horrified at the boots, at the combatants, missing it by inches. He turned to me. Look, your next death is just near there, isn't it? Could you pick it up? <laughs> I, I nodded and charged out with upraised cutlass. A pistol shot rang out and I pirouetted into a death roll. Once down, I dropped my usual pose of dignified corpse and pretended instead to be badly wounded. The trouble was that out there, under the lights, all things were glinting. My right hand scrabbled about, ostensibly in death throes, in reality jabbing at everything, that, anything which re looked remotely like a contact lens. I crawled further forward to, crush, to cover a, a, a fresh area of stage and prodded on. Nothing. I tried another area, still nothing. <laughs> Suddenly, I became aware of Long John Silver standing over me. He finished his speech to the audience and then muttered an aside. Well, you hurry up and die. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't solid la aim. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I had a minor backstage role for the Royal Shakespeare Company. I was on their tour down to the Aldwych Theatre in London. On arrival, they hired a stage doorkeeper called Henry. He'd previously been a cab driver and wasn't particularly keen on thespians. After a week, uh, after a, week uh, a week after he got the job, the loudspeaker crackled into life and Henry's voice came through. Hello, Henry here. There's a message here for a bloke called uh, Michael St. Dennis, right? The stage manager rushed down to tell him that he was talking about the hugely respected director, Michel Saint-Denis, <laughs> and that his attitude should reflect that fact. Yeah, all right, Mike, take your ear off, said Henry. A week later, the, the loudspeaker sounded again. Hello, Henry here. There's a taxi waiting for Michel Saint-Denis to take him to San Pancreas Stasio. <laughs> Later still, I had an, audi I had a, a, an audition at the Hampstead Theatre for the leading role in a play called Little Malcolm and His Struggle Against the Eunuchs.
by David Halliwell. I didn't get the part of Little Malcolm, or even as an eunuch. <laughs> I subsequently found out that the role had gone to John Hurt. It was his first success. I subsequently, um, I, I heard a story about, about Sir John, when he was a very young and very green performer. In his first TV performance, he was cast as a suspect in the police series Zeg Cars. In his first scene, the ferocious Brian Blessed, playing a very tough cop indeed, came in and bellowed at him, You're guilty of this, aren't you? John Hurt was so terrified that he went completely off script and blurted out, Yes! <laughs> Eventually, I decided that solo theatre was what I really wanted to do, and who better to impersonate an Oscar. And so began a theatrical journey that lasted 40 years. It took me from Reno to Reykjavik, from Hong Kong to Harare, from ecstatic highs and humiliating lows, but has never, ever been dull. It led to experiences like reciting Wilde in Addis Ababa, in front of the deserted imperial throne of the Lion of Jordan, of Judah. Or in Wales, coping with a lost horse who wandered on stage during the show. Or in Hamburg, making my voice heard against the amplified soundtrack of an erotic cinema on the one side of the wings and a fight in a gay biker's bar on the other. Or setting up a theatre run at the Dublin Festival and seeing the evaporation of my potential audience due to a papal visit. But on the plus side, hearing this, having the surreal experience of hearing half a million Dubliners singing Moon River as the Pope in Phoenix Park. Or having the lights fail just before a show during, due to a rebel attack on the Bahrain electricity supply. And two months later, learning that the hotel venue itself had been blown up by religious zealots. Or the experience of overhearing the young girl in Birmingham who asked her father who Oscar Wilde was and who received the answer, Oh, that's Kim Wilde's dead. <laughs> or performing Wilde to an audience in a European Union decommissioned nuclear reactor on the shores of Lake Maggiore in Italy. It had been renamed Lake Maggie O'Reilly by the local Irish expats. <laughs> or in Iceland, watching the steam rising from my breath as I spoke the first line, Ah, oh, August in Paris! <laughs> or in Belize in Central America, performing in evening dress and a fur coat as the theatre air conditioning failed and the temperature rose to 115 Fahrenheit. Or at the same show, spotting a row of ten wild parrots listening intently at the open window before they flapped off into the night. <coughs> and wondering whether be the Belizean jungle might echo to the sound of too utterly utter as a result. <coughs> She's doing it one moment. Oh. <laughs> Or the experience of <coughs> having a coughing fit in the middle of the <laughs> That's better. Or performing in, in Zimbabwe and the panic-stricken discovery that I had no valid work permit to perform in Zimbabwe. And the hasty retreat to the airport before the, the Mugabe government discovered the fact. And the knowledge that the ensuing joke about being able to write the Ballad of Harare Jail yeah. could have become a nightmare reality. <laughs> or the sensation of, of floating above an Islington pavement as I skip read a wonderful review and punching the air in triumphant vindication. Or touring the States and being trapped at one venue owing to a blizzard in California of all places. Travelling on to Virginia to find the theatre had gone bankrupt two weeks earlier, and then reaching the Carolinas to find that the promoter had died. Or well, the small theatre off Leicester Square, and the puzzlement of performing to a totally silent audience, discovering later that they were all non-English speaking tourists from Argentina. 
or encountering a, a group of Germans who arrived to see what was a British show about an Irishman being performed in New Delhi and who then walked out because it wasn't in German. <laughs> or the experience in Hong Kong, getting lost in a maze of backstage corridors, ending up in a boiler room and missing the performance cue by 10 minutes. Or apprehensing, apprehensively, noticing a Somali warlord and his four heavily armed bodyguards at the rear of the audience in recently war-torn Ethiopia, fearing the final curtain might have arrived in reality as they strode grimly towards me after the show, and then to my utter amazement being congratulated in cut-glass Oxford tones, I thoroughly enjoyed your show, break a leg. <laughs> the warlord having been educated at Balliol College, Oxford. <laughs> or surreptitiously reciting a few lines of Oscar that echoed up into the dome of the Taj Mahal. Or in the USA, retiring backstage at a at a very decorous Bible Belt country club after a successful show, declaring, Jesus Christ, I need an effing fag, and discovering that my radio microphone was still on, <laughs> and the fag meant something quite different in the States. <laughs> or in Bahrain, starting the show in my Paris cafe set, and listening to the audience laughter as a camel sneered dismissively through the window. <laughs> or doing an open-air show in a farmyard in Uruguay, being heckled by a flock of geese and a furious cockerel, and having to time my punchlines for when the cockerel paused for breath. <laughs> or the experience of performing the show in January on a Canadian train, travelling at 60 miles an hour through the Saskatchewan snows, and having to cling on to the, college, to the carriage wall to prevent being hurled into the audience. Or in Barnstable, Devon, having just one person attend the performance, the ultimate pared down theatrical experience. <laughs> a one man show to a one man audience. <laughs> or finding that the proposed hotel venue in Jordan had been blown up two days before the performance, and ending up reciting Oscar in an ancient Roman amphitheatre in the desert, wearing a baseball cap while a Jordanian army bagpipe band stood to attention behind me. Or sensing the breathless hush of a rapt audience as I spoke the final lines one glorious last night in Bulawayo. Or the teenage kids in Stratton on Avon who arrived to mock and quietly said thanks at the end. What had, what had started as a short theatre run at the Edinburgh Festival in 1979, turned, almost without my realising it, into an odyssey that lasted for four decades. I spent some of my time writing journals about the tours. These are a couple of passages taken from my book, The Crack Tour, about a visit to Ireland in 1999. As explained in the press cutting on the back of the, venue, uh, the menu, um, I was inspired by a book called Round Ireland with a Fridge by Tony Hawkes. I accepted the bet to perform The Wild Show 20 times in 20 times in 40 days, hitchhiking between the venues and living under canvas all the way, and living only on the money collected by passing a hat round after each show. This is what happened in a town called Kiloglin in the west of Ireland. I returned to the Kingdom Bar on the main street. The audience consisted of six silent farmers who sat in a row at the bar. A trio of local youths sat in another corner. A family with four young children sat in a far corner. Beside the stage, the pub television muttered away to itself. After 20 minutes waiting to see if any more audience might arrive, I finally stood up and took a deep breath. One should not play Narcissus to a photograph. The youngest child began to whimper. I pressed on. After a few minutes of expressionless staring, the farmers turned back to the bar to contemplate their drinks. <coughs> All I could see was a row of tweed patterned backs. The three lads watched for a bit longer, then transferred their attention to the television, which I suddenly realised had not been turned off. The, uh, 
the, 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 as the thing was almost beside me, the audience were able to watch the screen at the same time as the performance. The stony silence of the bar was broken by a laugh. I thought gratefully that at last Oscar's humour was breaking through. Then it dawned that the laughter had been for the comedy programme One Foot in the Grave on the television. <laughs> the show went from bad to worse. Every quip died on the air. It was horrendous, but the only option was to hang on in there like grim death and make it to the end. Just as I thought the conditions could not possibly get worse, they did. <laughs> Stage left, enter the village idiot. He was a slightly built middle-aged man dressed in a shiny brown suit. His eyes bulged slight slightly as he caught sight of me. I presume he was relishing the thought of a kindred spirit. He began by performing a little jig on the assumption that I might join him. I gritted my teeth and continued into the tragic Oscar Wilde in Reading Jail sequence. Disappointed at my lack of response, he came to the left-hand side of the stage area, removed his cap and started singing Bachelor Boy. We stood in a row like the three tenors. Victor Meldew on the television, Oscar Wilde in the centre and a demented Cliff Richard on the left. Performing to a line of farmers' backs. My only advantage that I could still shout louder than the others. We continued on to the end in a discordant three-part aria with Oscar's final ringing affirmation about the last trumpet. Let us pretend we do not hear it, partially drowning out mistletoe and wine. <laughs> Moving on to the east, I stumbled across a notorious pub near to Waterford City. The landlord was in his late 70s and ran the place exactly as he wanted it which was roughly what it would have been 50 years earlier. Nothing had been changed at all. The old fellow was the, the autocrat of the pub. The clientele was made up of his sympathizers, all old men in the shiny black suits and the flat caps. It was De Valera's island in a time capsule. But of course, the main thing about the pub was that he still refused to serve women. He insisted that they should not be flaunting themselves in a decent public house he was rigid about it. The only woman allowed in was his wife, so that she could do the washing up. <clears throat> One evening, the, the door opened, and two American, <coughs> two American girl hikers walked up to the bar. Can we have uh, two glasses of Guinness, please? The landlord folded his arms and said very sternly, No woman is allowed in this tavern. And all the regulars in the caps and the overcoats nodded away. Ah, yeah, your man's right there, yeah, your man's right here. Yeah. Well, the girls were very embarrassed about this, and one of them reddened up and looked around at the ring of censorious eyes and said, Oh, God, I'm really, really sorry. I didn't know you had gay bars in Ireland. <laughs> the look on the landlord's face was worth bottling up. Yeah. Well, there are highs and lows in the acting game. The money is feast or famine, mostly famine. There can be dreadful conditions, there's certainly no security. It's the artists who pay for the arts, not the public. So why do it? My answer to that can be found in the National Gallery in London. And it's a painting by Renoir called The First Outing. It's a portrait of a young girl aged about 12, clutching a posy of flowers and waiting for her first theatre show to begin, while an indifferent audience chats around her. It is a painting that should be hung in every green room of every theatre in the world and etched in the brain of every performer. It says that no matter how dire the money is, no matter how bored you are with the run or your role, no matter how dissatisfied with your performance you are, no matter how hostile the audience might be, no matter how bad the reviews have been, no matter how horrible the conditions are, and no matter how ill you feel, remember that somewhere out there, there is innocence and expectation and hope.
and in the teeth of cynicism, that's why we do it. Also, for 40 years I had the honor, the luck, and the joy of perpetuating the memory of a great man. The golden thread that ran through those 40 years was always the image of the funniest, the friendliest, the most exhilarating, the cleverest, the most far-sighted, the most courageous, and the most forgiving, and the most human of men. Mr. Oscar Wilde himself. Bravo. Bravo. Well, Neil, that was quite wonderful. It really was quite wonderful. You described hair-raising experiences. At the very least, they've been unlikely. Uh, more likely to be improbable and even more likely to be bordering on the impossible. Quite extraordinary and uh, hair-raising, as I say. I only hope that this evening has not added to your list of anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> but you found us as we are, an agreeable, very appreciative audience. We've enjoyed every moment of that bravura tour de force of yours. Yes. It was quite wonderful. Thank you.